Eastern and Pacific Time. And Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Now Robert Eisenman talks about the foundations of modern Christianity. His most recent book is called James, the Brother of Jesus. Mr. Eisenman is a professor of Middle East religions and archaeology at California State University at Long Beach. He's also written extensively about the Dead Sea Scrolls. He spoke at the Tattered Cover Bookstore in Denver, Colorado. Um, today we're pleased to have with us Robert Eisenman. Um, professor Eisenman is a professor of Middle East religions and archaeology and director of the Institute for the Study of Judeo-Christian Origins at the California State University. Um, he's also a visiting, visiting senior member of Linacre College in Oxford University. His pr previous writings include the facsimile edition of the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the First Christians. His most recent book, and the one he'll be mainly addressing today, is James, the Brother of Jesus, the key to unlocking the secrets of early Christianity and the Dead Sea Scrolls. In this book, we find that James, not Peter, was the true successor to the movement we now call Christianity. Please join me in welcoming Robert Eisenman. Thank you. James is perhaps one of the most underestimated people in New Testament history. In fact, he usually is confused with another James, James, the brother of John. And that's very important, the brother of. Because in my view, in this new book, James, the brother of Jesus, some of these characters move around something like a shell game. And you have to be very careful which character you're talking about, which character is historical, and which ca character may not be as historical as the other, and in some cases may even be overwritten over something more embarrassing. Let me explain what I mean. By the way, if you have any questions, we're going to have a long, hopefully, question and answer period at the end, and I'll pick up anything you want me to address regarding this when I'm finished with these introductory remarks. But uh, um, let me give you an example. The pseudo-Clementine recognitions, called pseudo by Orthodox authorities from around the third or fourth century onward, but no more pseudo really than any of the other books we have. Pseudo simply means it was written in the name of Clement. Well, we have books written in the name of Mark, written in the name of Matthew, and so on and so forth, and we're not sure of those authorships either or what they're saying. So the pseudo-Clementines are only pseudo insofar as the ideas in them are somewhat antithetical to the established credo of the time. But in any case, in those pseudo-Clementines, a, a romance, something like Acts, pseudo-Clementines are like an anti-Acts, and acts from the perspective of what we call Jewish Christianity. I think it's a poor term, but it means a philo-Jewish form of Christianity instead of a somewhat, mm, well, many people would argue about this. I'm sure some of you would argue with me about this, too. Uh, um, somewhat anti-Semitic view, uh, uh, anti-Semitic type of Christianity. I say that because, you know, Paul in Thessalonians, whether you like it or not, said, in some sense that the Jews are the enemies of the whole human race. And they killed all of the prophets. And they killed the latest ones, too. Uh, that, by the way, credo was picked up in the Koran, too, and is repeated there by Muhammad to deleterious effects that we all witness worldwide. Uh, but, you see, that would be an example of what I would consider anti-Semitism. I don't think that the Jews are the enemies of the whole human race. And frankly, I don't think they killed all of the prophets either. And you can go back on that one. They didn't kill Moses. They didn't kill Aaron. They complained against him. They didn't kill Nathan. They didn't kill Isaiah. They didn't kill uh, Jeremiah. They might have uh, had trouble with him. They didn't kill 
Ezekiel, they didn't kill Amos, they didn't kill Micah, etc., 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 etc. They didn't kill any prophets except perhaps Zechariah, which is an unclear case. There were no prophets killed at all. They didn't like some of them, but they didn't kill any. That is part of the polemics of our time. The idea that they killed prophets has to do with the John the Baptist and Jesus matter. It has nothing to do with the previous time. So you see, those are not, those are not accurate statements, and they do tend to um, make people hostile, to put it in a mild way. Anyway, these pseudo-Clementines, which are rather philo-Semitic, not anti-Semitic acts, these pseudo-Clementines have an attack by Paul on James in the temple. The recognitions, anyway, does. An attack by Paul on James in the um, temple. Now, if you line the pseudo-Clementine recognitions up with the book of Acts, you will find that this takes place exactly where the attack by the Jews on Stephen occurs. Now, I'm not the first person who've said this. Uh, Hans Joachim Scheps, back in the 40s, a German-Swedish scholar who had to flee Germany during the uh, Holocaust period and went to Sweden and then came back, he said this. He said Stephen was an overwrite for James, and I, uh, for the attack on James by Paul. He said that first. I'm not the first to have said that. I didn't understand what he meant at that time, but I believe now after much study he's correct. You say, I'll try to get at the end, why were these overrides? Why did these overrides occur? And if it's not satisfactory to you, and I, by, by the way, by going into these overrides, or some would say rewrites, I like the word override better, by going into them, we can tease James out of the literature. We can find James, because whatever you say, we'll see James in, is an historical character, and some of these other people, in fact, are ahistorical characters. That's why we have this thousand-page book. People said, my God, how could you write a thousand pages about James? Well, look at the book, and you'll see how we could write a thousand pages about James. Some of it is repetitious because I feel that since the reader is going through wholly new material and stepping in what, in fact, are like minefields, a little repetition to remind the reader of where he or she is at and what he or she may be forgotten about, very abstruse historical characters, is in order. If you look at the attack on Stephen in the book of Acts, and you compare it with the materials I give you in James, the brother of Jesus, you'll find that you have Stephen down on his knees. The key testimony to James's historicity in Eusebius, a writer in the 4th century, and here we're getting to abstruse things, based on Hegesippus, who was one of the early church fathers closest to the events in question, writing around 150 or 160 CE, pictures James down on his knees in the attack on James. Also, you'll find the same vocabulary used and the same vision. Stephen sees the heavens open in the attack on James in the temple by the final death scene, not the attack uh, by Paul in the pseudo-Clementine recognitions, but the attack in Eusebius' version of early church history based upon Hegesippus. You know, Eusebius was Constantine's bishop and was instrumental in organizing the early church councils that brought about the Roman form of Christianity we now know as the dominant one, but originally he had been bishop in Caesarea in, in a, a Palestine. So he was in touch with a lot of old Palestinian sources, particularly this Hegesippus, who never seems to have gone west and who was lost. So a lot of western theologians and early church historians like Tertullian and Irenaeus don't seem to know Hegesippus. So there's a whole eastern access composed of Hegesippus in the second century, Oregon in the third century, who, by the way, was considered a heretic uh, by some, and uh, Eusebius, and then Jerome, who comes east, gets in touch with Palestinian sources. So all of these materials I set out for you. Finally, the actual prayer Stephen utters, not only the vision, the fact of his being on his knees, 
The actual prayer is word for word the speech James utters in the attack on the temple. So these are things you wouldn't ordinarily know if you didn't compare the, the um, sources. So you say, oh, yeah, sure. The attack on James is overriding Stephen. Oh, perhaps. But maybe it's the other way uh, around, and that's for you, the reader, and the audience to decide. All I can do is give you my opinion. I put the sources out there, which is why we have a 1,000 pages. Uh, my publishers wanted this book cut down to 350. <laughs> Actually, we cut out 500 pages dealing with the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I felt, since it was so controversial, and since the dating of the Dead Sea Scrolls is so full of pitfalls and differences of opinion, such that now very few have any uh, agreement as to what these scrolls mean at all, that we should save the parallels of James with the teacher of righteousness of the Dead Sea Scrolls for a second volume. Actually, a lot of that is covered in this new book by Element called The Dead Sea Scrolls and the First uh, Christians, which recapitulates some of my earlier writings previously published by, by Brill. James uh, uh, the Just and the Habakkuk Pesher and Maccabees Zadokites, Christians and Qumran, which Bajan and Lee mention in great detail. So that weren't, they weren't readily available, and Element brought this book out in no November under the title The Dead Sea Scrolls and the First Christians. It contains those two books, five or six other very important essays, previously unpublished essays of mine, and three translations of key documents, the Community Rule, the Habakkuk Pesher, and the Damascus document. And the reason I thought it was necessary to translate those three documents again was because the presently available translations often miss the key usages because they're not tuned in to these key questions in early Christianity. The key usages, often they're not consistent. They don't call righteousness, righteousness, works, works, last judgment, last judgment in a consistent way, nor do they often have the militant apocalyptic spirit of these documents. You know, the community rule is actually banishing people and cursing them. Uh, and, and you really have to get the militant uh, apocalypticism of these documents. And therefore, I felt those are the key ones, and we have published them again in this Dead Sea Scrolls and the First Christians. Let's go back to um, James. So one of the first episodes then to worry about is the attack on um, Stephen. And frankly, Stephen is where anti-Semitism moves into the New Testament. Because Stephen really does uh, give voice to some extremely uh, um, um, hostile, if not inflammatory, statements about Jews and the people that are persecuting him. I want to say one of the things that I think happens in the documents that we have, and I'll explain to you why I think, that happens, and then you can ask me questions and I'll go further. One of the things which I think happens is that as James and Jamesian Christianity is written out of the documents, Pauline Christianity is written in, and anti-Semitism is also written in. Let me give you an example of where that occurs in my personal view. The characterization of Peter, the uh, uh, introducer already mentioned, that I think James is the legitimate, true successor of Jesus. Peter, too, is an important successor. But as you know, if you've read the scripture carefully, Peter is subservient in almost all instances to James, even in the picture of the book of Acts, which is very highly polemicized. Even there, in the final so-called Jerusalem Council scene in chapter 15. How many are familiar with that scene? The, uh, the rulings. Who gives the final ruling, James or Peter? James. And Peter is there, and Peter must defer to James's rulings. Those rulings are so important. Because another key thing I didn't know before I started writing this book that came to me as I was writing this book I know a lot of you are just beginning in this field. It sounds like Greek to you. This field is so complicated, and you have to comb at it with a fine-tooth comb, which is why so much pseudo-history, people will say, I'm writing pseudo-history. Uh, we'll see. And who will be the battleground? You folks are the battleground. 
you are the judge. Who's writing the pseudo history? And who is overriding whom? My book was reviewed in the New York Times by someone who was uh, formerly associate editor of the Catholic Biblical Quarterly and, a, uh, and Jesuit trained. Well, that's fair enough, but uh, honestly, I don't think this is the kind of book that you should give to someone who is constrained to certain beliefs. You have to come on this at this subject with a totally free mind. So, of course, he said that I'm writing the pseudo-history, and I didn't have my facts straight, and slammed me tremendously. But, in fact, if you look at that review carefully in the New York Times book review section from April, it's he who doesn't have his facts straight. And, you know, it is really very interesting. He, for instance, mentions one of the characters that I have in this James, the brother of Jesus, in my dedication page. He spent most of his time... Uh, um, arguing over my dedication page, uh, Monabasis and Kenadaeus, the two grandsons of the Ethiopian queen, which I put in inverted commas to show so-called Ethiopian queen. Well, all of you who have read the Book of Acts know where the Ethiopian queen appears. She has a treasure who Philip meets on the road to Gaza and then this eunuch, he's a eunuch. I'm going to show you, by the way, that is a malevolent characterization of the party of the circumcision. Remember, James's group is the party of the circumcision? Well, at that time, we will, that, these writers knew a, much more than we knew. And we'll see, I'll show you, that in fact it's the circumcision thing which is the key. But I don't show people that till, till, till chapter uh, 25. And that is actually written in here, uh, chapter 25, which is Queen Helen and the Ethiopian Queen's eunuch. So there's a whole chapter. He said, Eisenman, that is the reviewer said, Eisenman doesn't even know that Mona Bassus, see this is how abstruse this gets, and you got, it'll go way over your heads, but that's good. You'll go and you'll find, because if you're interested in biblical subjects, you'll go and find this material, because you want to know as much as you can know about this subject. Don't worry, I'm off on a swirl, but I'm going to come back. Don't worry, I know I'm out on a limb, but I'm going to come back. He said, Eisenman doesn't even know that Monabasis and Canadas, where are they from? Who knows where Monabasis and Canadas are from? What source is that? Huh? Josephus. These two people are killed. They are, they are uh, the grandsons of Queen Helen of Adiabene, who converts to um, Judaism, and they want to stare relatives want to circumcise themselves. And there's another teacher who doesn't want them to circumcise themselves. Well, you'll, you know how important the issue of circumcision is in Paul's letters. I bring all of that in. In any case, he said, Eisman doesn't even know that queen, uh, that, 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 that the Ethiopian queen didn't even have two sons called Kennedas and Monobasis. Well, he didn't even read chapter 25 where I draw the, the, the identity between the Ethiopian queen in Acts and Queen Helen in Josephus. So if he had read the chapter 25, he would have found that out. But this is the kind of thing that we get. Let me go back. Let's not get bogged down. I just want to show you the kind of thing that we get into here. But I will, I will assure you this. If you read to chapter 25, I'm sure a lot of you won't get that far, but if you read to uh, chapter, chapter 25 and the hair doesn't stand up on your head, and you don't say, oh my God, it's all true. It's all too true. Eisenman was right. Write me a letter. Tell me I'm wrong. I'm happy to receive it. But I, I know what will happen to you if you get that far. You'll say, oh my God, it's terrifying. It's terrifying what has occurred because the same thing happened to me. I couldn't even believe it when I started making the connection. And then I was able to go further. How many have heard of the document called MMT? <laughs> so few of us know these things. It's one of the key, there's a lawsuit about it in the Israeli Supreme Court at the moment. It's one of the key documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was written up in the New York Times, it's been argued over, and so on and so forth. Nobody knows what this letter was. What I do is put together the Queen Helen, the conversion of Queen Helen, her sons, the circumcision thing, and James's letter in the book of Acts. 
and also another correspondence in Eusebius called the Agbarus, the King Agbarus, the conversion of, Queen, uh, of King Agbarus in a place called Edessa, which is, by the way, where the Holy Shroud was supposed to have come from, in a place in northern Syria called Edessa. But what I show in my book is that that Edessa was also called Antioch. There were three or four Antiochs in the Seleucid Empire. This is how complicated all of this is. In Syria, there was one. That's the one we normally think. And James sent Judas Barsabbas and Silas down to Antioch with his letter of his rulings in the Jerusalem Council. If you compare the rulings in the Jerusalem Council with MMT, you'll see that they're basically there. Particularly the ban on what? Things sacrificed to idols. That is the key point. If you read your New Testament carefully, that is the key point. How many are even aware that James bans things sacrificed to idols in the key episode in Acts 15? How many here are aware of that? 3%, uh, uh, 15%. It's tough. But if you want to unravel this huge mystery and bring these people who have been consigned to the scrap heap of history back to life, this is the kind of thing we, you have to do, and this is why I think we take 1,000 pages to do it. They say, do it in 350. I said, they'll laugh at me. None of these arguments will stand up. They'll laugh anyway. None of these arguments will stand up. Aha, uh -huh, but at least at 1,000 pages, the proofs are there. And if you, and they say, oh, you can't write this for the uh, general public. The general public can't take this. Yes, they can. They can take it better than the scholarly public. Because often the scholarly public has entrenched positions that they're unwilling to part with. They've learned this. If, 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 if they didn't see this before, how come they didn't see that there was not a James, the son of uh, Zebedee? How come they've been juggling three or four Jameses? How come we've been, we've been juggling three or four Marys, and there really probably is only one? How come there's so many Judases, when there really is probably only one? Who is the one? Judas, the brother of James. Judas, the brother of James. Wherever, and that's what I show you, wherever the family of Jesus comes into question in the New Testament, we have problems of the historicity. And new characters, new characters suddenly appear. Now, I know I'm going around in circles, but I wanted you to get some of this in to think about. So what we show at several points is that this letter of James to Antioch, taken down by Judas Barsabbas. Who's Judas Barsabbas? <laughs> Another one of these multiple Judases. These are all the same Judases. Judas Thomas, Judas the Twin, Judas the Zealot, also known as Lebaeus, also known as Thaddeus. If you compare your gospel lists, you'll find that Thaddeus, also known as Lebaeus, surnamed Lebaeus, takes the place of Judas of James in Luke. So in Matthew and Mark, you have Thaddeus, surnamed Lebaeus, in Luke, you have Judas of James as this apostle. So you'll find, I give you all the sources on that, which is why we have the fourth and fifth parts of this book, the brothers of Jesus as apostles, and finally, Jamesian communities in the East. Those are the two sections my publishers really wanted me to get rid of, and I said, no, that's where the key arguments are laid out. So we also go into the other brothers of Jesus in this book. Let me give you a few of them. There is someone in the gospel list called Simon the Zealot. How many are familiar with him? In other gospel, yes, maybe Iscariot too, because we'll show you in this book that Iscariot is related, of course, to Sicari or Sicarios, and we'll see that we have various problems uh, relating to that, which I'll pick up towards the end of what I'm going to say and let you give me some questions, because it's too complex to do it in five seconds here or even in a half hour, but I just wanted to raise uh, these motives. Well, there are other brothers. There is, as we know from the Gospels, James, Simon, Jude, and Joseph. I want to show you that this Simon is Simon the Zealot, one of the apostles. 
just as James is James, the son of Alphaeus. And we draw these identifications very carefully over long argumentation, so you'll be able to see the parallels and from other sources that even make these identifications. There's a lost manuscript of Papias from the first latter part of the first century that may not be ascribed properly, but it makes these identifications that James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, um, Simon, etc., and Joses were the sons of Cleopas and Mary. So we'll show you also that Alphaeus is Cleopas, etc., etc. So there's a whole section on the other brothers, but it also turns out that Jesus has a cousin, James has a cousin called Simeon Bar Cleopas. He is the second successor to James and the leader of the Jerusalem church, so called. Well, Jerome, and I'll explain that to you in a moment, was the first person who decided that Jesus' brothers were not really brothers but cousins. What if Jesus' brothers are cousins or vice versa, then Simeon Bar Cleopas is the same as Jesus' brother called Simon. In fact, I think they are identical, and I'll show you why. And we have other uh, sources about Simon the um, Zealot. So all of those are recapitulated for you. Let's go back. I said, watch the brother theme and you will never go wrong. The battleground in the whole argument is the book of Acts. Now, if you know, most scholars don't deal tremendously much with Acts. If they do, they depreciate Acts. A lot of scholars I know don't even accept Acts as, as an historical document. I do accept it as an historical document, but the first 15 chapters of Acts are tremendously worrisome. In chapter 16, right after the Jerusalem conference, what we call the we document cuts in. And there, James emerges in no uncertain terms. That is, in Paul's final visit to Jerusalem, do you remember that? In chapter 21, Acts, he comes up and James is clearly the leader. But a lot of people confuse him with the other James. And I'm sure many of you are confusing him. Who's the other James? James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. Well, he's already been killed in Acts, I think it is 12. He's already been removed when our James makes his first entrance. So this can't be James, the son of Zebedee. The only James this can be is James, the brother of Jesus. But Acts doesn't tell us who this James is. We only know that he's the leader of the community, and we have to go to outside um, sources. And finally, it is he that sends Paul into the temple, he that makes Paul pay for four, under, four others under Nazarite oath, where Paul gets mobbed and arrested. And Acts is basically following Paul's narrative. Acts leaves off in 62 AD with Paul under loose house arrest, pre pre preaching freely in uh, Rome. Most of us don't think that Paul died till 66 or 68. It doesn't cover those later years. But who died in 62? James. How do we know it? Josephus. James was killed in Jerusalem in 62. But Acts doesn't tell us about it. Why? Oh, it wasn't the point of its uh, narrative. But you mean such an important event, the leader of the whole church, the leader of the Jerusalem community anyway, sometimes it's called bishop, sometimes it's called archbishop, shouldn't be covered in Acts. When it ends in 62, I think it should be covered. And I think the original sources did cover it. This is what I mean about the written out. I'll give you a few other examples of writing out, and then I'll take some um, questions to focus me on things you're interested in. We know from where? Multiple sources. Eusebius, quoting Hegesippus from the second century, Oregon in the third century, Jerome in the fourth and fifth century, and others. That James was elected as leader of the early church. And this occurred, supposedly, according to Eusebius, right after Jesus was taken up to heaven. Where is it in the book of Acts? It's not there. Why not? 
Our Acts has another episode. What does Acts have right after Jesus is taken up to a heaven or in the context of Jesus being taken up to heaven or right succeeding it? The election of who? Uh, a minor character called Matthias. A minor character called Matthias. And the defeated character, notice, is who? Justice. What is James' Latin name? Justice. The defeated character is someone called Justice Barsabbas, whom we never hear from again. Are you gentlemen coming in? like that worry me <laughs> and uh, I you know um, you understand why we're, we're, look we're, we're not trying to hurt anyone's feelings here what we're trying to do is to resurrect people from the oblivion they have been cast into in history we're not hurting anything that Christianity has to say because we're taking a brother of Jesus and bringing him back into life you know, I think if Jesus were alive today and things were said and done in his name that were not his, we, he would want us to know that. There are things statements said. There are wolf in sheep's clothing who are coming to deceive the flock. There are all kinds of polemical statements of that kind. So I think that if there were problems, and I think after the Holocaust, he would expect us to do this. If these things contributed to the Holocaust, and I'm going to show you some things that did contribute to the Holocaust, the mindset that caused that, that is fed into people's minds generation after generation as holy, as holy writ, as truth, when in fact a lot of people who believe in these things are embarrassed by those things themselves and would like a, a way out. I give a way out. Who? The closest person to, Je to Jesus, his successor his closest living heir, his actual heir in Palestine, if not elsewhere. You know, at the end of my book, someone said in one review from the Jerusalem Post, Eisenman's conclusion is apocalyptic. That is, who and whatever, if you're looking for the historical Jesus, basically you need to search for the historical James. The pseudo-Clementines say, and this is a statement attributed to Jesus, be like good money changers, able to tell false coin from truth. I say if you're looking for the historical Jesus, you should look for the historical James and who and whatever James was, so Jesus would also be. I'll come back to the Judas Iscariot thing in a moment, but since we're on the James thing, let me just tell you one quick point which is so moving and touching about James. From my other source, I haven't even got into it. I've all, done all the negatives. James was a vegetarian. I think because he kept the extreme purity regime of the Qumran community and then some. James was a Nazarite from his, from his mother's womb. There's nothing of this that's offensive to any of us. All of us want to be holy. There are many of these things that are very sympathetic to us. So how do you know these things? James is the most documented person outside of the Bible of anybody in the New Testament. We have more extra biblical material about James than any other character, including Peter, including John the Baptist. The only one who compares with James for extra biblical material about him, you know, James is in the Nagamani material. 
the only one who compares is John the Baptist. We have a long testimony to John the Baptist where? In the Antiquities, in Josephus. But other than that, we don't have a lot of testimony to these people. Peter, we have very little about. Now, I'm going to tell you something about Peter in a moment. All of these people, John the Baptist included. John is a vegetarian, you know, according to the uh, Gospel of Luke. John was holy from his mother's womb, just like James was. That is a lifelong Nazarite. These people, according to the pseudo-Clementines, whether right or wrong, you'll have to go to the pseudo-Clementines and weigh them and see if they have anything in them. They're novels, true, but so the material we have is novelized. You have to compare one with the other, be like good money changers. But the characters that emerge are very sympathetic. Look, Peter, according to the pseudo-Clementines, like James, is a vegetarian. You know, I have a dedication in this book, a quote from the pseudo-Clementine homily, which quotes... Peter, preaching, things we don't even have in Acts. And these are very old sources. Uh, they may not be as old as some of our, our other sources, but they're very old. Here is Peter, pseudo-clementine homily. Our Lord and prophet who has sent us, declared to us that the evil one, having disputed with him 40 days, but failing to prevail against him, promised he would send apostles from among his subjects to deceive them. Therefore, above all, remember to shun. This is where I bring up, remember I mentioned to the community rule? And uh, Josephus' Essenes, too, they shun backsliders. They curse backsliders. Uh, but anyway, let's go on here. Uh, therefore, remember to shun any apostle, teacher, or prophet who does not accurately compare his teaching with that of James, the brother of my Lord, and this even if he comes to you with recommendations. Peter Clementine's homilies, 1135, Peter preaching at Tripoli. How many have heard that? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. It's, well, a few of us have, but the reason is these are the excluded materials. But some of these materials have pearls of wisdom, and we don't know about the historicity. You'll have to be the judge of that. It's like the O.J. Simpson uh, jury. You are the final ones who will make the, the, the decision after weighing the evidence. So we give you the evidence. You decide, but look at the Peter that emerges in the pseudo clementines He's a daily bather. He's a vegetarian. He wears threadbare clothes like the Essenes. He rises before dawn and praise every day. Now, we don't get any material like that in the Book of Acts at all. You can collate the speeches in the Book of Acts attributed to Peter, and basically they recapitulate Pauline doctrine, particularly that the Jews killed all the prophets, and the Jews are stiff-necked ne ne and always disobeying the Lord, etc., etc., etc. There are five speeches, I have counted them, where Peter says that. Just like Stephen says, some say exactly the same thing. So my conclusion is, as James was written out, as I told you, anti-Semitism was written in. So I don't think that we're doing a disservice to the material. I believe we're rescuing it from extreme things that you would not want on your conscience. And you would want to historically revive what you would want on your conscience. And we are bringing these people... Jesus included back to life as extreme holy people. Also, to my, uh, uh, to my way of thinking, part of the uprising against Rome. Let me go back to two other episodes, and then I'll finish up at least this presentation. We're talking about the election. So what do we have? A Judas Iscariot. Someone actually voiced it here. Judas Iscariot. Judas is Sicarios. That's the closest word we have to it. Judas the Sicari were the extreme form of zealotry. But, you know, even I didn't know these things when I started writing, which is why it got so long. It turns out that in the second century, the Romans saw all circumcisers as sicarion. And they used this because, you know, uh, Josephus tells us that the, that the sicari were the knife people who had daggers. And they assassinated people with these daggers. But there is a Roman law, the Lex Cornelius the Sicarius, which sees uh, circumcision, at least in the second century, as bodily mutilation. In fact, Oregon supposedly mutilated himself, cut off his sexual parts. It's one of the reasons he was excommunicated. And uh, it's in Jerome. And uh, Oregon, uh, Jerome uh, laughs at Oregon in that particular instance. And uh, this is said that 
Oregon is a Sicarius because he took off his sexual parts with a knife. Sica is a Roman knife. So it's a circumcision knife as well as a terrorist knife. And this is very interesting that I didn't even know. So when we go back to Judas Iscariot, or when we go back to the eunuch of the Ethiopian queen, we're dealing with people writing who know a lot more than we know. So Judas Iscariot is another one of these multiple Judas. Well, I don't want to get into too much of that, but you know, you, Judas, has become basically the pejorative in Western civilization for traitors. And all the family of Jesus are considered, to some extent, by the Western view, somewhat traitors, backsliders, to the Paul view. Now, you know that Paul in Galatians does treat his controversies with James, the brother of Jesus, and they're very severe, and he treats them in quite some detail. So I think that's a primary source. There's no overriding there. When you get down to these materials, where you get a primary source that you can rely on, that comes um, first. So the controversies of Paul and James are very extreme. You say, why could this have happened? Because the people in the West who followed the Pauline approach basically were antithetical to the people in the East who followed the Jamesian approach. And the documents we have come out of, to a certain extent, Greek quarters. They're written in um, Greek. They're written mostly from the point of view of those in the West, particularly after the fall of the temple. So it was very good. It was very easy to pejoricize people. But what you're basically doing is pejoricizing this Jewish form of Christianity. I'm not advocating, I'm just stating a fact, this Nazarite form of Christianity, this holy from the mother's womb. So in the Judas Iscariot episode, I think we have a characterization. I don't think there really ever was a Judas Iscariot. The election to succeed Judas as such, as a betrayer of Jesus, to me that's part of the polemics of the period. So we get the election of Matthias to succeed who? The twelfth apostle to flesh out the twelfth apostle scheme. But Paul doesn't even really know anything about the twelfth apostle scheme. There are apostles plural. James is one. Paul makes it clear in Galatians that James is an apostle. Of the other apostles, I saw only Cephas and James. He makes it clear that, that uh, uh, James is an apostle, and I'm sure that James was an apostle, if we can characterize exactly what apostles were, which I tried to do in this book. But instead of electing an inconsequential 12th apostle to flesh out a idealized scheme, I think what we really had there in the earliest history was the election of James to succeed his brother Jesus. And you can do that all the way across. We get, as I told you, the attack on Stephen, taking the place of Paul's attack on James. Go to the pseudo-Clementines, what happened? Paul threw James down the steps of the temple, left him for dead, but didn't kill him. Then James's group fled to the Jericho area. Very precise detail. How did that get in the pseudo-Clementines? I don't know. But these are things we have to uh, uh, worry about, and I don't have time today to worry about all of them. Let's go into Steve. Uh, let's go into Peter, and we'll finish up. Peter is portrayed in Acts as greeting the Roman centurion Cornelius. And they're learning that he can accept Gentiles. This is a totally different view than the pseudo-Clementines of um, Peter. And if you know, this episode reflects to some degree Paul's arguments in Corinthians and Galatians. Particularly in 1 Corinthians, Paul is laboring James' instructions to overseas community and talking about food, things, sacrifice to idols, and saying... For him, everything is permitted. But when these weak people, these people with weak consciences, these vegetarians, and by that he clearly means James and his group, come, well, for their conscience's sake, refrain from eating. But Paul says, ultimately, all things in the butcher shop marketplaces are clean. In the same breath, he enunciates his understanding of communion with the body and blood of Christ Jesus. Well, again, that's so complicated, <laughs> we go into this book in great detail on that subject. But the point is, Peter, in the episode with the Roman centurion, gets Paul and I. Instead of the pseudo-Clementine Peter, Peter in tatters, Peter observing extreme dietary co laws, P Peter preaching James's uh, abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, the key point, 
By the way, you know in Josephus' description of uh, the Essenes, they abstain from food sacrificed to idols, and they're willing to go to their deaths on this point. So all these people are joined in our sources. Look, it's really interesting, the conjunction of all our, our sources. Well, Peter says in that episode, a tablecloth come down, comes down from heaven. Peter standing on a rooftop in Jaffa. A tablecloth comes down from heaven, and Peter says, the voice says, eat, Peter, eat. And Peter says, no, Lord, I've never eaten any forbidden thing. I think that is the true Peter. And three times the voice cries out to them. And then what God has made clean, let no man set aside. And Peter learns that he should call no thing and no human profane. These are very noble thoughts, but I don't think they're the historical Jesus, or the, rather the historical Peter. They are the historical Paul. So these are where we have to look very, very carefully. And I give you a lot of other episodes. Finally, who was it who was responsible for James and the other brothers being cousins, or considered cousins in some of our religious traditions? Jerome, I said, where did he get that? He got that from an episode in the Gospel of John that Mary has a sister called Mary. Do you know that in the Gospel of John, Mary has a sister called Mary? Mary, sister of the mother of the Lord, and she's married to Clopas. You remember Clopas, again, I mentioned before, the father of Simeon, Barcleopas, etc., the so-called uncle of, of uh, Jesus. In Luke, Clopas is the first person to whom Jesus appears on the road to Emmaus with an unnamed other. All that is too complicated for us to deal with today, but it shows how complex our sources are and how much information really is here. Well, Mary has a sister called Mary. Jerome exploited that to, the, to, 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 to say finally that these are the sons of Mary and, and um, Clopas. What I finally uh, conclude in my book is that as the doctrine of the supernatural Christ gathered momentum in the second century. Brothers became cousins, fathers became uncles, mothers turned into their own sisters. And in fact, I believe Jesus turns into his own brother. The fourth brother is who in gospel lore? Joses. J-O-S-E-S, -E which except for the vowel, we don't know anything about Joses. We know a lot about Simon. We know a lot about James. We know a lot about Judas. We know a lot about these other characters. Uh, James, we, we can fill books with, as we can see. Uh, Josie's the one we don't know because, in fact, Jesus turned into his own brother. Well, I leave you there. There's a lot I didn't cover, but that's why we have the book there. I hope you'll find it interesting. Thanks a lot for hearing my remarks today. Sure, there's a couple of subjects and I'm the first one to admit it. But there's no subjects that are barred here. The scripture, um, Paul uh, was probably the first person to write anything down in some of his cohorts. And the question I have is, are we looking at history being re rewritten by people later trying to impose uh, a greater level of, uh, of sort of, uh, what's the word, making Christ really like the Son of God, rather than an ordinary prophet? That's or, part of it. Or are we also seeing history being changed for political reasons later in the second and third century? Or is the scripture both, we see? Both, okay. All those are part of it. All those are part of it. You see, this gentleman knows that, according to the Ebionites, and I didn't bring them up because it's more technical material, which many of you have never been heard of, but you know, it's not bad. Because if I say a phrase that you've never heard of, what, what happens? You want to go and find it out. Right? I don't want to not know something. I want to know that. And frankly, I'd rather know Ebionite than Madonna. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that you can get your teeth into that you don't know. And that's always great if there's a lot of stuff out there that you've never heard of that you can get your teeth into. And one last thing before I answer this person's question I want to hone in on, and that is this. That, you know, everyone will have their own view of this. For each person in this room, there'll be a different view. That's great. That's where it should be. Mine isn't the final word. I would be dishonest if I gave you a different view than the one I have, just to, satis just to satisfy you or flatter you. The only thing that I think you'll find is after all is said and done, when you get to chapter 25 of uh, my book, if you have another explanation 
for the facts that I give you, and the Ethiopian queen's eunuch is the key fact, then I'd really like to hear it, and you'll be really in a, a difficult strait to explain some of these things that we set forth. But as far as uh, what you're sa this uh, gentleman knows, that among the Ebionites, the poor, which is what Jewish Christianity was called in the early church, the Ebionites, because of their supposed poverty-stricken conception of Christology or the supernatural Christ, Jesus was only seen as a prophet. Sure, to combat those ideas, a lot of our materials were, were written, and Paul is already at work in, in his letter. The letter of James is not combating these, these materials. In fact, the letter of James mentions the poor, and uh, the poor are very important to the letter of um, um, uh, James. And in the final part of the letter of James, what do we have? An attack against the rich. An apocalyptic attack saying, you rich who killed who? The righteous one. Jesus, the Messiah, is called the righteous one, a, a beloved concept in Judaism, the tzaddik. You who killed the righteous one, you rich who cheated the mowers in the field, wait. For the Lord God of hosts is coming. You know, when I was young, I thought when I said those prayers about the Lord God of hosts in Psalm 24 and said, etc., lift up your head, O ye gates, I thought the Lord God of hosts meant people who were nice to their neighbors and received their neighbors gently, that they were, gave hospitality. The Lord God of hosts is the vengeful conception of the final judgment that we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the War Scrolls of the Dead Sea um, Scrolls, which I link up with James's proclamation in the temple. So you have materials in the letter of James that are pretty anti-Pauline for sure, very close to Ebionitism, very close to the Dead Sea um, Scrolls. You know, the letter of James was the one letter uh, Luther was very upset about and didn't want to include in the, in the New Testament, felt it was uh, unchristian. Even Eusebius in the fourth century is already calling it spurious, which is very surprising because uh, you don't usually get church fathers calling documents within the scriptures spurious. It is unchristian. It's the most Dead Sea Scroll-like document we have in the early church text, but I can't go into that. But what you write about the Jesus as prophet and the political thing, really we're getting a pacification of messianism, not this apocalyptic. I'm not for violence or apocalypticism. I'm just for doing good history. I know the Ayatollah is not a sympathetic character, and James may have things in common with the, uh, the Ayatollah. If you, if you knew the historical uh, John, you would find things quite apocalyptic, and we even get it in the picture of him, you know, telling the scribes and the Pharisees that the, uh, they're fleeing from the vengeance that is coming, and the fire is in the fan, and the uh, chaff ready for the burning, etc. Things we get in the scrolls, particularly in the war scroll, which I will link up closely to these early conceptualities, so the key thing is that these early Christians in Palestine who were Nazarites, stream purity uh, regulation uh, uh, observers, daily bathers, probably many because of extreme purity re regulation, vegetarians, they also probably were revolutionaries. And that is the other thing that we're getting in the scripture to kind of make it um, seem like we have a more pacified uh, situation in Palestine that we then we act, uh, actually have, and Jesus the Messiah is our Prince of Peace. The peace being, in my view, the Pax Ro Romanum. If you want to get the perfect anti-Zealot statement of the Pax Romanum, go to Paul in Romans 13. There he says, only malefactors have anything to uh, uh, fear from the authorities. He also says, if you know that uh, section, that the wearers of the sword will have their own reward. And he recommends paying taxes. The tax issue being the key thing, because the tax collectors are the representatives of God. That is, the authorities have been placed on earth by God. The tax collectors are their representatives. Well, there I part company with Paul. And personally, I think the people in Palestine did too. The tax issue was the burning issue, as we'll find from the beginning of the Zealot movement. So I don't have time now to do that, but I link all these things up for you from Josephus and elsewhere. This is the thing that I think is worrisome, that Jesus probably died a revolutionary death also. So you have a combination of things, extreme Essenism, extreme piety, extreme purity regulations linked 
up with revolutionary things. This is a unique combination, and the place we're going to look for that is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So yeah, I think that's the reason we get a different Palestinian history than overseas history. Without the Dead Sea Scrolls, we couldn't have pinpointed it. But now we have native Palestinian documents that do combine extreme aestheticism with revolutionary fervor. That's why some people look at the scrolls and say, oh, these are Essenes. True, they are. Other people look at them and say, oh, these are our zealots. True, they are. You know, there was an historian in the early church called Hippolytus, who some people don't think he wrote this manuscript, but he's in Rome in the third century. He has a different version of Josephus' testimony to Essenes. And I think it's an earlier version of Josephus that he conserves there. I give you this testimony in my book. Everything I hope is in here that, that you will need. Something you don't find in there, write me a letter, tell me I left it out. That's why the length is such, but I thought you would prefer that. In any case, he says there are four groups of Essenes. Two of them, one he calls Zealot Essenes, and the other he calls Sicari Essenes, Knife Essenes. And he says these Sicari Knife Essenes will kill... My, I don't recommend this. Anyone they find talking about the law who is not circumcised. Well, this is crazy stuff. We don't get in the ordinary uh, Josephus. So there you see we do have the scrolls closer linked in this, this testimony of Hippolytus in, in the third century that there are zealot Essenes and even extreme Essenes. You know, how many have heard of Masada here? Josephus identifies the group that committed suicide on Masada. So these are extreme revolutionary partisans. Who are they? The Sicari. He calls them the, the Sicari. These are not assassins up there. These are extreme revolutionary ascetics. And I think we're getting close to the material when we get closer. So yeah, we have a lot of problems here. Another question, yeah. Um, what do you think the uh, status of Jesus' family was? Uh, it seems that if James was elected, it almost is a, uh, after Jesus, it's almost a dynastic um, political structure. Did it come out of a poverty-stricken carpenter's household, or was there something more to back? I think there was it? something much more to it. What, I think we have a kind of Nazarite movement, and I go into that a lot, but I don't have time now, that has moved into what we call Na Nazareans, and then go, even though the root is not exactly the same, and then goes over into what we call Nazarene and Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I think originally we're dealing with Nazarite. I think Matthew knows that. When he says uh, uh, he shall be called a Nazarite means he goes to Galilee. I think uh, uh, Matthew is aware that these people, including John the Baptist, James, and others, were lifelong Nazarites. And I would also include Jesus in that. So yes, I think there is a movement. I can't put my finger on all aspects of it. I think the righteous teacher at Qumran has a lot to do with it. You know, in Hebrew, the righteous teacher is more a the teacher of, of righteousness. We have a lot of material about how the teacher of righteousness was killed. A lot of it relates to Habakkuk 2.4 in the Habakkuk commentary. You know, Habakkuk 2.4 is the key passage in the letter of James, in Paul, and in Hebrews. All of Christian debate, aside from the suffering servant in Isaiah uh, 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 revolves about the righteous shall live by his faith. The James position versus the Paul position. Faith versus works. Habakkuk 2.4 is in the Habakkuk commentary. I've said that is the key Jamesian point. Because the, uh, the interpretation of Habakkuk 2.4 and the Habakkuk pressure is Jamesian. In any case, James was called the righteous one. We have the teacher of righteousness at Qumran. James the just in Latin goes to James the Chaos in, in uh, Greek, back to James the Tzaddik in Hebrew. And the more ascetic is the Tzaddik par excellence. The righteous one, par, that is what he is. So I don't say that James and the righteous one are the same, or that James and the righteous teacher are the same from Qumran. I only say that James approximates that righteous teacher better than any other person, historically speaking, that we have. And that the two are very parallel. So if they're not the same, they're at least very close parallel. The only way you would decide if they're the same is to work on the chronology of Qumran, and nobody, uh, nobody has succeeded in doing that. So yes, I think what we're doing in, in, in here are uh, succeeding on getting everyone to agree with their uh, position on this. But what we have here is what you're saying. Some very complex things going on in Palestine, centered around the Essenes. You know, the Dead Sea Scrolls documents, the Habakkuk commentary, Pesher particularly, 
addresses itself to the who? The Ebionim, the poor. Ebionim in Hebrew is poor in English. This is the name for Jamesian Christianity in Eusebius' work in early church history, Ebionites. So the Dead Sea Scrolls say that they're Ebionites. I'm sure they were Ebionites. So in any event, we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of things going on there, covered by the scrolls, covered by Essenism, covered by Ebionitism, and um, so on. And I think that uh, what we're trying to do is bring some of this back to life, and the scrolls help us do it. Yeah? The way I understand it, the uh, early Christians weren't revolutionaries. They, they tended to stay away from politics, and they were separated from other sects like the, uh, what those Essenes at Qumran, and the uh, any violent type yeah. uh, murderers. I would agree with you. That's the picture we have from the documents we have. The Qumran documents give us another picture. They're much more apocalyptic, much less, uh, they don't believe in turning the other cheek. They don't believe in loving their neighbor. They, they hate the sons of the pit. I'm not recommending them. I'm just saying what Palestine was. So our Pauline groups are much more congenial to us, and I understand that as a modern person. But we're just doing history now. What really happened? Jesus dies a revolutionary death on the cross. That is a revolutionary death. Crucifixion was the punishment for so sedition and subversive uh, uh, um, uh, activity. Uh, there is an embarrassment over that. And that's where we get these accusations against the Jews and others for having conspired and caused this. You know, let me give you an example. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says that he escaped down the walls of Damascus in a basket in order to escape the representative of King Aretas, the Arab king from Petra, who wanted to arrest him for some reason. In Acts, Paul, it's clear, escapes down the walls of Damascus in a basket in order to escape the Jews who want to kill him. Now look, there's only one way out of that. Either Paul escaped down the walls of Damascus twice, or the book of Acts is shifting history over into anti-Semitism. And I believe we're getting a lot of that throughout the whole thing, pro primarily because of the problem we're dealing now. Was there a revolutionary m movement in Palestine? Was it revolutionary messianism? Or was it not revolutionary messianism? And I personally think it was revolutionary messianism. I think I'd better stop there, because I notice a lot of people, it's a hot day, a lot of people want to get moving. We want to sign some books here. I know you have a lot of other questions. Frankly, I hope you'll read it. If you don't agree with me, that's good. Get your own solutions. To them. I don't want you to agree with me. I don't want parrots. But I do want to stimulate you into thinking. And finally, finally, if you think that you can do a better one, please do it. Otherwise, let's just see what comes of what we're doing here. Thanks a lot. Jack Bamberger, sure. from Robert Eisman, whoever he is. <laughs> <laughs> who, 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 whoever Jack is or no, who it's whoever you are. I have no idea I the, why. I, I read the whole book. <laughs> yeah, and what did you find out? I loved it. Yeah, you liked it, huh? Yeah. I was in the seminary and I... Uh, I think I've got stuff in here no one's ever heard of. No. Well, Plus well, approaches to things no. they've never thought about. Well, well, approaches, yeah, but I've heard of most of that stuff, and I thought, why didn't I put all that together? Right. But we do try to put together by the end. And you need this kind of uh, a total uh, weight, don't you? Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I think I was just fortunate to be able to get it out in a popular form for, uh, from a mass audience, because honestly, I trust the mass audience judgment. Uh, one of the re reviewers said, oh, Eisman trust the mass audience and not scholars uh, to weigh this stuff. Yes, because I think the mass audience is sincerely interested and really uh, wants to get their teeth in it and will make up their own mind. A lot of people free. talking about this. Are they? Yeah. What, this particular book? Yeah. We're here in Denver? Yeah. Well, I'm so out of it in Long Beach, I never hear about it. <laughs> well, that's great. I'm glad to hear about that. What is your name again? Jack Bamberger. Mm. Oh, that's you. You're not giving this to someone else. Well, I thought you were giving this to someone else. Oh, okay. Well, Jack, that's great. I'm glad that uh, people are talking about it. Now, are you originally from Baltimore? I'm from New Jersey. New Jersey. I'm from the freeway in between uh, Philadelphia and New York. I was just picking up my account. What's your name? Matthew. Well, that's a good name, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> 
I find it very hard to compress this material into an hour or so without people getting you know tired because yeah. it works better in question and answer and also it works better from reading. You got all the facts, take your time, wait through it. If you don't agree with this, fine. So then you do a better analysis. But we have all the sources and they're given to you and they're all in one volume and then you you deal with the material. Yeah. Well I almost threw this through a window when I read that you're gonna do a volume two. <laughs> church sources and Josephus and apocryphal gospels and things. We didn't go into the scrolls at all because that's too controversial. This I think we can nail down. Nobody can deny the things about Stephen, the election to succeed Judas, or the first appearance of James in uh, chapter 12, uh, you know, who is Mary the mother of John Mark. There's no Mary the mother of John Mark. There's only Mary the mother of James. Uh, he goes to Mary the mother of who, John Mark's house uh, to leave a message for James and the, and the brothers Peter? No. Goes to Mary, the mother of James's house to leave a message. And we have other inf information showing us that Mary did have a house in Jerusalem at the time. Uh, the uh, Sir Clementines tell us, and also the Gospel of uh, John Im it implies it when he says, take this uh, woman into your house and adopt her as your mother and so on. And so, on. so we have a lot of material we can link up, and we try to do that. Do you think the wedding feast at Cana is uh, Judas's? Wedding? Cana is very interesting because of the uh, symbol symbolism of, of Canaan and stuff like that. So it is uh, extremely interesting. Right. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Enjoyed your talk. I'm a prison chaplain. I'm a prison chaplain, and what you said is so important about the whole way that we are looking today scripturally at anti-Semitism. Are you aware of how the whole supremacist movement in the prison to the trauma keepers and other prisoners? No. Oh, it's there. What you were talking about is so critical. And I would like you to, what we would call the Vatican III Seminary in Exile. Hold on, I wish you'd write me about that at Cal State Long Beach, because I can't talk about it here, but you'd write me about that. Let me tell you what's happening. We have a Wait, I mean, what am I dedicating? What are you talking about? Oh, this is to the Vatican III.